So when you look at an airplane, there's a pilot in, up in the front that's flying the plane. In most companies, that's the president or CEO. But in architectural firms, the architect who owns the company tends to want to be the flight attendant who's in the back doing the projects, helping the clients, and integrated into that part of the business. Business of Architecture, episode 335. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. This podcast is a production of Business of Architecture, the leading business consultancy that has helped 103 and counting architecture firm owners grow and improve their practices. Today's show is also sponsored by Layer App, the flexible database for architects that makes it easy to view and share photos, files, and project data right in Revit. Get a completely free 14-day trial to go check it out by visiting layer.team forward slash B-O-A. That's layer, L-A-Y-E-R dot team, T-E-A-M forward slash B-O-A. Today's guest is Elise Makarevich. Be better today than I was yesterday. Elise Makarevich applies this philosophy to her life as a mother, wife, architect, small business owner, and volunteer. She's the founder and president of AMB Architects based in Houston, Texas. In this role, she ensures happy clients and successful outcomes on projects the firm undertakes and maintains a work culture that keeps employees fulfilled and energized. AMB specializes in corporate, retail, healthcare interiors, and new construction and provides landlord and facilities management services. Elisa's goal with AMB and what sets it apart from other firms is the firm's employee first culture. Now, a lot of firms say they're employee first, but I think you'll find in today's interview that there's a distinction here that Elisa's going to tell us about. What this means for them is no more all nighters burning the candle at both ends. AMB staff is organized to provide employees balance. Work life balance is a huge focus for us here at AMB, says Elise, and this mentality leads to happy employees enjoying their work and giving it 100% ultimately resulting in great projects and satisfied clients. Abraham Lincoln is reported to have said, Give me six hours to chop down a tree, and I will spend four sharpening the axe. Elise believes in this philosophy and as such has invested heavily in her own personal development, leadership, and management skills. She's a certified DISC consultant and Ziegler Legacy Certified Trainer. She uses these skills to train employees based on their strengths and their own personal development goals. Elise also donates her time to the American Institute of Architects, BNI, Business Networking International, her neighborhood homeowners association, her daughter's Girl Scout troop, and as well as holding a variety of leadership roles in each of those. A very busy schedule. She holds personal time sacred and uses it to spend time with family, build massive Lego projects, crochet, read, and travel. Elise, welcome to the Business of Architecture show. Thank you, Enoch. Happy Elise, to be here. It is so it is so great to have you here, and it, it, it is it is so interesting to hear. Uh, architecture notoriously is a profession that can be all consuming. Number one, because let's face it, we love it. Number two, we're not tied any other way. But it sounds like you've drawn some very clear boundaries about uh, business and the the way it synergizes and fits in with things outside of business. Tell me about that. What was the motivation behind doing that? And then we'll jump into today's topic, which is all about weathering downturns. I think having a daughter and being married first and then having a daughter. And in the beginning of my career, I was not very well balanced. And knowing that I want to have, be a good mother and have a really good marriage, I needed to figure out how to balance it all. And I can super easily just spend all my time focused on one thing. I mean, I'm, I am wired that way, but consciously making the time and prioritizing being at my daughter's events or doing things for her at school, being there for my husband and doing things for him. And then also balancing in when I might need to do something, um, with the firm for an event, make my husband go with me to galas, um, you know, to balance it all in. So everybody is, is wins. And that's, but that's a conscious effort because it's really easy to fall into being a workaholic. And uh, running a firm is no small task. No, no. 
Um, but I, I mean, I love it. I truly love it. And I've started, when I started out in my business, I knew when I was leaving the firm that I was working at, I was managing a team. I loved managing my team. I had other ways I wanted to treat um, clients. And so that's what kind of set me out. The other, th the other thing about when I started my firm, well, I, I have this idea about culture. And I call culture, it's a layer cake, and actually whole business is a layer cake. But you, you put things into place intentionally in the beginning, and then once you have one layer in, you can add to it and add another layer into it. It doesn't have to all be, you don't have to have the, all, the whole cake going at once in the beginning. So initially when I started my business, I wanted to see if I could have a successful architectural firm that was profitable where we could work 40 hours a week where you didn't have to work on weekends, you didn't have to work in the evenings, you could decide that you wanted to coach your son's you know, little league or something like that and then rearrange your schedule so that you could leave early on Wednesday afternoons to do that. And so how, what does that look like? And I also wanted to make sure that women could stay in architecture and have families. So how do you balance that? How do you allow for that to happen? And so that's how I started with my first layer. And as the years have progressed, we've I've been in business for 15 years, it's showed up all, time and time again with women who are maybe having a second child and can't do not know how they're gonna do it. And so as they're on their way out the door to leave from maternity leave telling me, I, I think I need to resign. I don't think I can do this. I don't know how I'm going to do this. And encouraging them to, you don't have to make that decision now. You don't, you don't need to lose your benefits. You can keep those while you're on maternity leave. And then when you're on the other side and getting ready to come back, then you can decide then. If, you know, maybe it's, it's a part-time, maybe you're not managing projects. And the interesting thing is th the women would say to me, oh, I never thought about that. I didn't even know it was an option that I could come back and work at a different capacity. Um, and so that person did come back. She didn't resign. She came back. She started part-time. And before she was through with all that, she had created a position for herself and wanting to be um, like an operations director and help train and help others in the firm as well as managing projects. So she actually gave herself a bigger role when she came back from her maternity leave, more of an extended maternity leave, maternity leave and part-time, than she left with. And now she's a managing um, principal at our company and has grown into that role. And, and because I'm open and have the conversations and encourage and help them give them space to, to see what they could do, they're able to, to be the best that they can be at the other end. Instead of just having being impatient and saying, okay, fine, you want to quit, quit. Um, and then if you want to come, we'll have a discussion then. You know, how can I help them see a different way? Because I don't think there's a whole lot of models out there um, that show that way. And, and I have had several um, women that have left on maternity leave and come back on different in different terms and figure that process out and they know that they can and I think that's really important and being able to keep them um, in architecture I think is a huge accomplishment knowing that a lot of women do not stay in our profession. I remember when we spoke years ago for one of the first times you shared with me your vision of creating a firm that would be safe and welcoming for women that had other roles they wanted to perform in such as mothers raising children, et cetera, and you really wanted to be able to have that positive synergy between house and and work, whether whether it's a man or a woman in the role. What do you think for you was the key of being able to stay true to that and really build that work environment in that way? One is the commitment to doing it, and when things get hard, you can't deviate from it. I will say if I ever did get frustrated, and especially the one um, lady that I talked about, she will... If I talk to her in my frustration, she will hold me accountable to my vision and say, is that really, is, I know you're frustrated, and is that really what you don't want to do, and that doesn't, that doesn't match up with our values, and it's like, okay, and at least I have some place to, to air it out loud um, and be held accountable for what my intentions are. Uh, it's great, because I'm not perfect. I, you know, you, we all kind of have difficult times and may uh, deviate from what our initial um, intent was, but then getting back on the path is really important. And what would you say would be some of those frustrations? Help me understand, what are some of the fr frustrations in Elise's world that 
Yeah. Get her upset or irritated. <laughs> uh, don't turn in time sheets. I mean, it's the normal silly things in architecture or you feel like maybe someone's not uh, working as hard or they're taking advantage of certain things, benefits that are given. And, and, and there are times, so when my team tells me that the, uh, an individual is taking advantage and they all are coming to me and telling me that, then something needs to be done. But I work hard at creating rules for everybody or guidelines or processes and procedures that works for the right things. I don't want to manage or make rules for the bottom 5% or 10%. I'd rather have that person leave than have to put in a rule or some sort of HR protocol or lock down timesheets or have people sign in or all these things that you would do to try to manage that bad behavior for lack of a better term, but then to take away the privilege from everybody else that's being an adult and a professional and doing what they should be doing. And so we have a lot of freedom, a lot of flexibility, a lot of voice. Um, so pretty much my whole team at this point is, is able to call me on anything, have ideas. If they're frustrated with things aren't working well, um, I do goal setting review sessions every quarter with every employee. I can meet with them earlier if they need me to, but that's really where we're, I'm listening for what's working, what's not. And those sessions have been so valuable. Usually when there's something not going well, they all speak up and we're able to implement something like we were having a disconnect with people work, more people working from home. And this was before the whole COVID thing. And so we implemented using the tool Slack so that people could ask questions that they would normally walk up to someone's desk and ask in an application. And then like, where I'm looking for this detail. Someone could tell you where the detail is, or I can't find whatever, or do you know what to do in this situation? And so that everybody will seem to be having that same disconnect issue. And when we implemented that tool, everybody felt a lot better and felt like they were more connected and were able to get the answers and didn't feel like the working at home was as disruptive anymore. So they all embraced a new technology. They all put an app on their phone. They put it on their computers where you might have uh, people that are, uh, don't want to participate or, oh, we got a new thing we got to deal with and why are we using this? So when everybody decided there was a problem and the, here's a solution that might help, they all embraced it to see if it would help. And we've used several tools. We use Basecamp as a, a project management kind of tool, which is an inexpensive tool because we were struggling with delegating. And so we had these different sessions of why aren't you delegating? I mean, it's great to say, hey, you need to delegate, but you might as well be telling something, hey, where's my purple elephant? Because if you don't know how to delegate and you're not spending any time helping people learn how to delegate or what our unique issues are in our firm, you're not going to learn. They, I just can't expect them to magically figure it out. So we had some sessions. We called them pods. They lasted for 30 minutes. We did some interaction we learned something we talked about how we could implement and we wrapped it up and then we came back the next week and so what did you implement or why didn't you implement it what are you struggling so we went through a bunch of different tools and ended up with wanting to try Basecamp. and so they all embraced that everybody got on it and used it and we've used that product for a long time but again they saw a need and a problem and were trying to look for a solution and they came to me with uh, Basecamp as a solution that they wanted to try so those are kind of some of the things that, you know, pain points that you might see along the way and then trying to help them uh, have a voice and feel like they're part of the solution. And again, I learned about those doing those goal setting review sessions. Beautiful. At least what is your what is your philosophy strategies on growing people? Because in, in a relatively short amount of time in terms of an architecture firm's life, you've been able to promote people up through the ranks, you've delegated effectively and empowered people. How do you do that in a firm? What's your philosophy on that? One is to be open and listen for things that they want to learn and give them opportunities instead of maybe pigeonholing them or this is what you get to work on and that's it. We, when I hire, it's kind of interesting because when I hire, we tend to hire people that want to move up through the ranks and be a project manager and you already know that from the get-go. We have hired a few people that we knew they were going to be support and they 
they didn't have the ambition to raise through the ranks and stuff. And we do struggle with that and, and, and our expectations for that person. But knowing, coming back to them, knowing that they are, um, they want to be support, they're in the office, we need that role. And, and then working with the ones that really want to grow. So listening to ideas that they have, like we just implemented um, virtual reality. So we can do that on all of our projects. But there were team members that are uh, junior team members that had that interest and really dug into in their extra, I can go into my extra non, the, I've now, we now use non-billable time um, more strategically instead of it being just this thing that exists. Um, they, it now has a purpose. So if they don't have enough billable work or they, we already use ability at 81%, they have extra time every week, what do you do with that? So now we have intentional things that we do with it. So the virtual reality was one of them. So they get to dig in and then they turn around and train all the rest of us older folks how to use the virtual reality and give them a place where they feel like they're significant and bring value. So instead of assuming you don't bring value until you have a certain experience level, years in the company, those kind of things, we try to give everybody a way to show value and bring value because we're all different. We all have different strengths and we can all bring things to the table. So there's no limit on how fast you can grow or where you can grow to. We use a strategy where people have um, a billing per person per month metric to meet. And if they meet that metric, it doesn't matter. And it depends on what level you are, you have a different number amount that you're meeting, but then you get a bonus and the bonus can be significant based on those numbers. So they have the ability to excel. The fabulous thing about that one was is for me to try to manage and tell them what to do to get to that number or to try and get to that all by myself as a firm owner and, and get our billings up was almost impossible. And I struggled with that for years. But when I gave it to them and said, here's the goal and here's the prize, essentially, this is what you get, they figured out all this stuff. So they started streamlining templates and things that they were doing that even took an extra 10 minutes of time. How can we fix this so we're not spending that anymore? And so the mindset changed. And now we're, we're, we sit at about, before COVID, a 25% to 30% profitability uh, margin on our, co our company that we've achieved. And that's because they figured out how to do all these things faster, more efficiently, spend the time doing the things that they really like doing and not this other um, meticulous stuff that I guess were repetitive stuff that they don't need to be continuing to do if we can figure out how to do it better and faster. So that's been huge. And again, that's something that's helped us tremendously during this current downturn that we're going through because we had that 25% that could come off for break even. Um, and everybody's busy and able to do stuff because we've got some key things that they can work on to help the firm that's not billable because we've already been working in that realm. At least you mentioned that you have uh, people are motivated because there's there's a game or there's a reward or an incentive at the end of the, the track, so to speak. What kind of incentives do you have in the firm to help people get by and keep them motivated and help them want to meet those kind of benchmarks? So we do multiple things. We do team, um, like doing lunches together or going out and uh, I'm going to keep saying that before this, we'd go to the movies and have a lunch um, as a team to celebrate that we've done something. It's interesting based on people's um, post personalities and what they motivate in the whole DISC thing that I'm involved in, that I've got trained in and the Ziggo Legacy certification have helped me to see that not everybody's motivated the same. Some people are motivated because they help the team. Some people are motivated because they individually get something. Something small, somebody might say it's not worth my time to do, but something that's collective that everybody gets to do together it would motivate them even though it may not be as much as that what they considered was something small. So we just did a uh, email campaign to brokers and everybody, we emailed out 850 personal emails, the whole team did, to brokers that they knew and brokers that they didn't. And this is out of people's wheelhouses, big time. And at the end, um, we had little things. We do stuff like they like a certain type of pen and we got rocket books. And so there's new markers that are erasable and they like fun, tactile, stuff to use in technology and things like that. So we did some of that. We do lunches, um, go into them, like I said, go into the movies together. 
and I don't, we have a lot of fun just in general. So those kind of rewards. But when it came to the billings per person per month, they actually got a percentage of what they contributed to o, that they build beyond their goal. And so they got a, a bonus <clears throat> once a quarter based on uh, that. So we, I do a combination of uh, monetary rewards and fun, uh, inclusive rewards and then little other perks. And what, what, what is that percentage or does it vary by person that, that they get beyond the billing? I think right now they get 10% of whatever was over their billings. So if they build an extra $1,000, they got $100. But usually it's they bill 10 or 20 or $30,000 over and they're getting 10% of that. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. And you find that works pretty well in terms of giving them incentives and they appreciate it? Yes. They appreciate it. And it's been interesting because I felt that as some so some projects aren't as profitable as others. And I was worried that by doing that and setting that standard that I wouldn't be able to consistently do that because I wouldn't actually have the money. And so I've that 10% was a, a number that I used to make sure that I covered everything was able to reward the folks that were contributing above and beyond. And then they get promoted. So if you are consistently above and beyond, then you move to the next salary level. Got it, got it. And have you seen any negative impact that you've had to deal with because of that? Maybe some gaming of the system, maybe people rushing through things to try to meet targets instead of really delivering quality? No, because they all have value quality and value the relationships with the clients. And, you, and again, I feel like a lot of things I didn't do in the beginning because I was afraid of these things that I dreamed up that would be negative consequences. Yeah. And through my coaching and all the stuff that I've learned, give it a chance, see what people do, and then address uh, what comes out of that. And if it's not something, you, you, most of the time you're never even going to need to worry about it. That most people are inherently good and working for the right reasons, are excited to be on the team and happy and willing to contribute. And if we, you know, if we, they win, we all win. I mean, right now we are all employed. No one's worried about their position at my firm. They're not worried about layoffs because of the way we've implemented our system. Nobody's exceeding their billings because we're all below. So no one's getting a bonus, but we all are have a job. We all get to come in every day. We get to work on projects and have, you know, purpose and meaning and a place to go. And it's huge right now. And, and I would say I'm super proud of my team. Um, I enjoy coming into the office every day and seeing them and interacting during this time. They are part of what's helping me get through this difficult time. And, and I think we all are helping each other get through the difficult time, but they're just an absolute joy. And I think because the environment has been set up to be positive and transparent, I mean, they know the break even number that we need. And if we're not making that break even number consistently over time, something will need to happen. But until that happens, nobody needs to worry about anything. And so they all have a level of confidence that, you know, where the firm's doing well enough. So they're not fearful of, oh, I don't know, or how are we doing? And it, there's a lot of transparency. So there's a lot of confidence and stability. And in the beginning of all of this, that's something I wanted to make sure that I communicated and we had, because I didn't want the fear. Because the spouses of my employees, some of them have been laid off or furloughed and having to deal with that. And I didn't want them to have unneeded fear or unnecessary fear about their position. So knowing that it could happen, but they they can see the signs with me along the way if I'm transparent so they can feel as comfortable and safe and, you know, as less fearful as possible because we have enough to be afraid of. That's really incredible, Elise. Good. Thanks. I'm proud of my team. I love them. And that's another thing. I mean, I would say we are definitely a family. Most of the people have, most of my team members have been with me for the majority of the time the company has been around. Um, we've had some team members leave and do other things or get married and take on other adventures. But And I've had four team members that have left um, because we predominantly do interior architecture and they've come back because they tried to do or went out to do ground up and experience some other types of architecture but valued the firm, uh, the flexibility, the, the valuing of, you know, mothers and architecture and saw that as a a huge asset that they weren't getting where they were before. So I've 
I'm proud of that because I know I'm winning. It's right, I, rightfully goal... so. Rightfully so, Elise. I mean, that is truly incredible. Absolutely. Now, my you... goal when I started that layer cake, you, yep. that's how I like I can say that today I see it. I see yeah, that it's that's working. beautiful. You started with the vision and you're 15 years down the road now and you can see that the cake is there. And yes. it, it may have some divots here and there, but other, other than that, it's beautiful and it has wonderful frosting and it really, really turned out good. At least you have been around 15 years and that's long enough to go through three recessions, three major, major, well, depressions, recessions, what downturns shall we call them? <laughs> and right now we are in we're in COVID is when we're recording this right now. And you sent over some notes ahead of time about your lessons learned from these. Uh, each one had different lessons and each one had different situations. I'd love it if you could walk us through that and kind of talk about the lessons you've learned from going through downturns and what you've done to be so well prepared for this one so that our listeners can take some of these lessons away. And if they're not perhaps as prepared as they'd like for this one, focus on improving their firm so they can handle and succeed through the next one. Okay. So our the first one, so I started my firm really at the beginning of 2006. So when we had the financial housing crisis in the 2009-10 realm, um, that was the first one that I had to weather. And I had no idea what I was doing at that time. I was still a project manager on projects and had a big role in my firm. I have had a business partner and we had a total of 12 employees. And figuring that out, I had, well, one, I also had a payroll company that was helping me. I had a PEO, and they actually helped me do a bunch of layoff during that time. But I had to lay off employees. We ended up, they didn't, something uh, happened that was kind of odd. They had extra time, yet they weren't meeting the deadlines on projects. So you found so that your, your staff actually had more time to work on things, but they their productivity, their efficiency, whatever went down and they weren't actually meeting deadlines. Is that right? Yes. So that was kind of an odd phenomenon. So what I did was, is the employees that I had left after the, we had a layoff is we actually reduced everybody's time by 20% and their salary. And they, and they, we had a conversation and they were all in meeting build to this. And then they had Fridays off. And that allowed them to have a tighter time frame to get the work done that they did have. And we were more successful meeting deadlines and everybody was happier. I had a marketing person at that time um, that was also helping us that we reduced his time. And one of the other things that I did have in place before that downturn was a line of credit. And that line of credit helped us tremendously weather the slow payment of clients and some of the little deficits when we weren't breaking even gave me the the buffer to figure this stuff out because once I didn't do anything ahead of time on this one because I didn't know anything. So it just happened. I didn't have enough work. The amount of revenue coming in went down and I started having to make decisions. Did you, so at with that, that time, line of credit, was there any floating salaries and paying people when they weren't being productive? In other words, were you financing the firm out of that or were you pretty much breaking even and just using it to supplement? No, I was financing the firm out of that. That okay. was helping me keep it going. So you had a bit of a hole to dig out of. Yes, yes, definitely uh, a hole. So you were, and, you, and you, a, you spent that money to keep people on instead of laying them off. Yes, because we appeared to have the work that they needed. Okay. I mean, we, we had the amount of t billable time that they were busy at that point with what I had reduced it down to, but the, the how much we were billing each month fluctuated and then how much cash was coming in the door fluctuated. So I was using that line of credit to help even all of that stuff out uh, Got at it. that time Got it. because it wasn't always consistent. And when I looked back on that, I had $5,000 left in that line of credit when things started turning around. And so I was $5,000 away from not being able to do any of that anymore and starting to have to keep the firm going on my own, um, either credit cards or savings, which I, I didn't do. And I have never done that from in my company. But after that recession, the funny thing too was getting the employees to come back and give up that Friday, it took a while. I think it took several months <laughs> to get everybody funny, yeah. to come back because they have, were enjoying those oh, yeah. silver linings. Um, they were enjoying those three-day weekends, and, but they did all come back. And the ones that, were, that I hadn't laid off. So after that, in 2012, I was told about a program called the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses. And there's, they, there are 
locations across the United States done in community colleges, and it's still going today. I think they did, I don't know that they quite hit the 10,000 small businesses yet, but they're close. And this was an invaluable program. You apply for it, you get a scholarship from Goldman Sachs, and it is essentially it's an MBA for successful small businesses, is to help you grow and learn. And I learned so much, and, and I also learned about peer learning from other small businesses. And then I built a whole network of other small business owners that have has been invaluable to today. I still have a round table that meets monthly um, that was built out of that program. And in that program, I learned that I, I call it who's flying the plane. So when you look at an airplane, there's a pilot in, up in the front that's flying the plane. In most companies, that's the president or CEO. But in architectural firms, the architect who owns the company tends to want to be the flight attendant who's in the back doing the projects, helping the clients, and integrated into that part of the business. And most of the time, we have no idea what it takes to actually fly that plane, what it takes to run the business. So that's what I learned during that Goldman Sachs program. And I also learned that I can't do all of that. I'm, my strengths don't lie in all those areas. So I need to hire people or outsource or companies. I need to find other ways to, to fill all those roles that are needed to fly that plane. And then I can choose to do what I would like to do that makes me happy while I get up every day to come to work. And, and since that time, I was managing projects while I was going through that program. And it took me four years to get out of managing, uh, pro completely not managing any more projects. So training my team members, this is when you're talking about how do I promote. I, since I got out of that role, I no longer take that position in my company, so I'm training and helping. And if I do have team members that get, as we get bigger and bigger projects that need help, I step in and help coach and guide through those those areas of the project or process when I see that they're struggling so that the project is as successful as it can be, they can learn and I'm not having to be the lead all the time. So that took a while to do. And as I did that, I decided what part of the business, business development, coaching, and leadership, um, and the finances that I wanted to do. And then I've gotten other people involved to do the other areas that are, I'm not as good at, like the marketing type stuff. I'm, and I've struggled with marketing for years, I mean years, years and years and years. And I feel like we've just kind of hit a stride. But I, and I also got a coach during that time. So I learned a whole lot after that first recession. And I also did something really cool because I was like, how, I want to be profitable. How can I be profitable and how can things be easier? And so I read like four books on profit and I went to a training to help get all my finances in order and see what I didn't know that I didn't know. And Because you can have an accountant and all that kind of stuff, but you need to know what you're trying to achieve and accomplish and metrics and numbers you want to hit and what is going to help drive your firm and what you do. So. One of the big books that I took away, it's called Profit First, and it's by Mike Michalowicz. And since my last name is Makarevich and Michalowicz is really close, it's really easy for me to remember. But I started that process, and I was able to put, my goal was is to get one and a half months worth of revenue in something he calls a vault. So it's cash that's there to just help me. So now I have a line of credit, which I increased. I keep increasing my line of credit, so it, I'm, I try to get it so it equals one month's revenue. So I've increased my line of credit over time because the bank will only give you money when you're doing well. When you need the money, they will not give you the money. That's something I've learned. Also, it's also good to have more than one banking relationship. And I can elaborate that on a little bit. Um, so I did that. So when I went into my next downturn, I had that cash, I had that vault, which was, again, huge to help you weather. The other thing that we were doing is we were tracking a metric. Um, on Mondays in staffing, everybody estimates their time, how much billable time they have for the week. And looking at that on a weekly basis lets you see, okay, so we have less and less and less billable time. And I can see that there's a whole person's worth, there's two people's worth, there's three people's worth of time. So I was able to start getting rid of or laying off some people that weren't the mo that weren't on my 18 players before that, the second downturn. So in the summer of 2016, we had a, well in 2015, we had an oil market crash in Houston. And so by the mid 2016, I was starting to see those, the billable numbers go down. And, but I wasn't seeing the revenue change yet. So the first recession, I waited till I saw a revenue change. The second recession, I could see it coming before the revenue. 
So I was able to reduce my expenses and set myself up um, so that when it did, our revenue fell, was cut in half in December of 2016 and pretty much hung out there for like 14 months. And the first downturn took 12 months. I did this calculation for I was trying to figure out how long I think this one that we're going through right now might do. So I calculated the numbers. How long do I have to weather this? So the, the oil market one took 14 months. So I was trying to work on getting to break even. Um, I that time I had already laid people off, had reduced the expenses. I ended up having to reduce the expenses for the owners. And what else did we do? I mean, really, I mean, I just I worked on. I asked my landlord. I went back and said, "Hey, is there anything you can do?" And they gave us a, a several months of free parking. Uh, anything you could do to gain some help during this time. So, and then we weathered it. It took a long time. I used, when we weren't breaking even, I used the money out of the vault. And so I used all of the vault. I used some of my line of credit to weather the ups and downs. I still got paid. I never, I've never not taken a paycheck. I've gotten paid every month since I started my business. It's varied over time, but I've always been paid something. And so that made it so that we got through that one and turned around. Turned around and started doing the vault, built my vault back up. So I have a vault as of um, this year coming into COVID. So I have a really strong team. I love my team. I will do everything I can to protect my team. They protect me. Um, I don't want to lay anybody off. I have all A players and I have, there's 10 of us and I want to keep them all. So that is not part of my kit of tools this time going into this recession. But this time, because of my profit first, I've been able to figure out how to build up a 25% profitability in my company. So my profitability took a hit. And so we are hanging out at no profit and break even, but I haven't had to reduce anything else. I haven't worried about any expenses, anybody's salaries. I'm not paying bonuses right now, but I'm still able to buy lunch for my team and do some nice things. We're not in this, this miserable place like we were before. And I implemented something I call holacracy. So instead of having overhead employees doing uh, billings and marketing and all of that kind of stuff, all my team members, a year and a half ago we started this, they each took a section of the business they were interested in. It gave them some sort of balance so when they had non-billable time, which inevitably happens in an architectural firm, that they have something to do that they would like to work on other than billable work. So some are doing marketing, social media, updating templates, looking into new software that we could use, virtual reality. So there's a myriad of things that can be done that they can spend their time on. So when we rolled into this crisis, um, COVID-19, they all just picked up all those projects that they were working on and man they're moving so fast on our marketing initiatives and so i can't keep up so now we started having to have meetings so we can all come together and show how far we've moved forward because it's been just exponential so when we come out of this it's going to be huge for us but everybody's happy nobody's missing deadlines because they all have enough other things to do that have a huge benefit for the company I also did outsourcing, so I have an outsourced person that helps us do copywriting for our blog post and is reviewing our marketing message. I've outsourced um, some of our accounting processes. I've outsourced IT, but none of those are full-time employees worth of salary, even all combined together. I've outsourced my IT, like all of our servers are in the cloud, so if the world blows up, as long as the data center doesn't, all we need is a computer and we hook back up. So there's a lot of things I put in place this time that this is... It's scary because there's a health factor. You want everybody to be safe. I don't want my employees to get sick. You know, there's that whole thing. They've all been, we've been working from home for years, so that wasn't an issue to transition into that. Some of my employees do work at home more often now than come into the office. They have a choice. If anybody doesn't feel well, they all stay home. <laughs> you know, they can keep working, and then you have a balance of your, you don't have to use all your vacation. We're super, super flexible with what people are allowed to do. And as long as they all know, if we're all succeeding, if you're doing what you need to do for us all to succeed, then it's all great. And no one's micromanaging anybody as, as it comes to having a great team and getting work done. And they do a great job. 
they do they go above and beyond keeping clients happy and getting stuff done and doing it in a timely manner and it, they're just fabulous again I'm super proud of them but there's a lot that's gone into this um, to get to this point you know, the good since 2012 so we've got eight years worth of at least learning to be a better leader to then turn around and, and give opportunities to my team so they can grow and learn for us to be in the position we are and a lot of sometimes I feel like I'm like not needed and have to and you don't want to be needed because then they're not self-sufficient and but when you are needed you're needed and it's really important but it's not eight hours a day so amazing any do you, any thoughts well that brings us right i wish we uh, you know me i would love to talk for another two hours but it brings us to the top of our of our interview right here elise it has been it has been fantastic and look let's face it we could we could drill down really deep on all of these subjects culture hiring uh, engaging team members managing profitability finances i mean there's there's so much and i love your analogy of who's flying the plane that is such a great great analogy so Elise Makarevich, thank you so much for joining us here on the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you, Enoch. Appreciate it. And that's a wrap. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practices, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture because you see it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back it's the complexity of running a business managing projects and people dealing with clients contractors and money so if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven simple and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. Today's episode is also sponsored by Layer App. Layer App takes all of your project related data, photos, and files and makes them accessible with the click of a button right in Revit. So let me tell you how this works. It took me a while to get the concept. Uh, say that you go to a job site and you take a bunch of pictures. Now, you get back to the office with your camera loaded down with hundreds, perhaps even thousands of pictures. And now it's your job to organize them in a way that makes sense so you and other team members can easily find and use them later. What a nightmare. Now, imagine instead that instead of wrestling with categorizing photos and renaming them and trying to organize them in folders, that the moment you took the photos on your smartphone, they were immediately linked to your Revit model where you or other team members could access them with the click of a button. This is what Layer App does. You can also link other project data like spec sheets, project notes, and anything else to elements right within Revit. So here are two reasons why I thought, as a listener, you'd want to try out Layer App. Number one, if you currently work for a firm, the last thing you want to be working on is tedious work like categorizing and organizing project information. If you're a firm owner or principal, your firm could save thousands in staff time just by using this app, not to mention the convenience of having project data at your fingertips right when you need it. I hope this is a valuable resource for you. If you use Revit, Layer App is a must-have. Find out more and get a completely free 14-day trial at layer.team forward slash BOA. It's layer, L-A-Y-E-R dot T-E-A-M forward slash BOA. And by the way, if you listen to episode 338, you can hear my interview with Zach Soflin, the founder and CEO of Layer App, the architect turned software developer who created the product. And get your free trial at layer.team forward slash BOA. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.